Hi, Tim here. Every now and then I take the opportunity to have a mini break from putting out new episodes, but it also presents a great opportunity to dip into my back catalogue of episodes to pull out some that got a lot of listening engagement, and which are also topics that I still get asked a lot about. And for this week, it is on one of the most common questions I'm asked about, and that's how much protein do we really need for muscle growth with exercise? And do protein supplements do any good? As a postscript to this episode, its focus was mainly on muscle growth in more younger active exercises. But you may want to check out one of my recent podcasts, episode 66, on nutrition and healthy aging, where protein recommendations go way up to help fight and prevent age-related muscle loss. Enjoy. The protein powder supplement market is big business. Popular in the world of sport, where muscle growth is a priority, the marketplace is dominated by glossy pictures of cut models and an ever-expanding list of claims for how these products will pack on the muscle. So, do the bros at the gym have it right in that you need these supplements if you're serious about the gains? Or could plain old boring food do the same job? In today's podcast, I'll dig deeper into the world of protein and muscle growth and explore what the research says about protein supplements, and then put this into context for what it means for the typical sports person. Welcome to the Thinking Nutrition Podcast. My name is Tim Crow, and I'm a career researcher, educator, and science communicator with most of this spent in the field of nutrition. How do you make sense of so much conflicting information in the field of nutrition? While I don't profess to have all the answers, in an area that is continually changing as research changes, you can count on what is covered in this podcast to be based on the whole field of nutrition science, not just selective areas that support a particular way of thinking. And this podcast will always be free from any commercial product tie-ins, endorsements, or advertisements. Just credible nutrition science presented in plain and simple language, and then translating this into what it means for your health. So on with today's show. The protein and amino acid supplement market is big business. Bars, shakes, giant tubs of protein and specialist amino acid supplements dominate supplement shelves and all in the name of bigger and stronger muscles. Now, few athletes would disagree that more muscle is an advantage in their sport, and protein is the perfect source of the the amino acid building blocks needed for new muscle growth and repair. Taken together, strength training and sufficient protein will stimulate new muscle protein synthesis. So, Is there a role for additional protein through the use of supplements? Is it a case of more is better when it comes to protein and muscle gains? To answer these questions, let's first explore just how much protein sports people need. Consensus position statements such as those produced by the American College of Sports Medicine give the range of 1.2 grams to 1.7 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight. But the top end of that range of 1.7 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight is for elite endurance athletes and athletes in strength and power sports and those in the early stages of a strength training phase as they ramp up their gym training. The recreational athlete which describes the vast majority of active sports people, should aim for the bottom end of the range, which is around 1.2 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight. And just to add to the current science here, a 2017 meta-analysis of 49 studies looking at protein supplementation in resistance exercise training with a focus on muscle gains found that consuming protein above 1.6 grams per kilogram of body weight did not result in any significant further muscle gains. And I'll link to the review in the show notes. So all this talk of protein needs 
and expressing it in grams per kilogram of body weight assumes, of course, you know how much protein you're actually consuming in the first place. So outside of doing some detailed self-dietary analysis, let's look at how those protein requirement numbers stack up against the regular diet. As an example, protein intake and body weights collected in the 2011 to 2012 Australian Health Survey showed the average Australian male already eats 1.2 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight. And for the average female, it's 1.1 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight. And this is for mostly sedentary people who are not following any special high protein training diet. Now, sports people do have higher energy needs, so by simply eating a greater volume of food with a focus on a higher protein content, it's very feasible for any athlete to get their protein requirements from food alone. No supplements needed. And this concept that athletes can meet their protein needs with diet alone has been backed up by research, with numerous dietary surveys showing the normal diet of strength-based athletes provides about 2 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight per day, and that is before using any protein powders. But before you think there's nothing to see here when it comes to protein supplements, they cannot be dismissed altogether. There are circumstances where supplementation is an appropriate and convenient option for athletes, such as when traveling or during an intense training schedule, where it is physically difficult to access, prepare, and consume food as proper meals. So ready-to-drink protein supplements and solid bars do make for convenient on-the-go snacks. And then there is the case for athletes trying to drop weight on energy-restricted diets. They may find it harder to meet protein requirements, so a protein supplement could be of use during that time. Under energy-restricted conditions, a greater proportion of amino acids are used for energy production, resulting in fewer amino acids available for muscle growth. So the idea to supplement with protein here has some merit. While the research in this area is not as mature, there have been several commentary articles advocating that for athletes trying to drop weight and wanting to maintain and promote lean body mass, then protein intakes of between 2 and 3 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight could be considered. At these sorts of numbers, protein supplements certainly enter the game. So moving on from daily protein requirements, what about the notion of optimizing muscle growth through the timing of protein consumption? Optimal muscle growth and recovery are more than just about meeting daily protein needs. And this is where the concept of protein timing around exercise has some credence. Each time protein is consumed, there is a small spike in muscle synthesis with a dose of just 20 to 25 grams of high quality protein being sufficient to stimulate muscle protein synthesis following resistance exercise. Having these protein doses spread throughout the day can help to maximize exercise-induced muscle growth and aid in the repair of damaged muscle tissue. Eating quantities of protein above this 20 to 25 gram range in one sitting offers only a limited additional benefit, with a very minor 10% further protein synthesis when the amount is doubled to 40 grams of protein. However, despite the common recommendation to consume protein as soon as possible post-exercise, evidence-based support for this practice is currently lacking. That does not mean that it shouldn't be done, only that it shouldn't be treated as gospel, despite what the bros at the gym may tell you. How long this mythical post-exercise muscle anabolism window remains open for is still hotly debated, but it likely exists for several hours. So, Fear not, gym goers, your muscle gains are not going to shrivel away simply because you didn't chug down your protein shake within five minutes of your last set of bench presses. And there is a nice commentary paper on this topic of protein timing published in 2013, which I'll link to in the show notes. 
So combining all of the protein timing research together leads to the conclusion that the body likely responds best to regular small doses of protein throughout the day. I like to call this new muscle growth optimization protocol regular meals and snacks with a focus on higher protein foods. Others may just call it eating. So that's dose and timing done. What about the form of protein that is best to consume? Not all protein sources are created equal because of their amino acid makeup and how quickly they are digested and absorbed. And in the field of sports nutrition research, it's dairy protein that consistently receives a lot of the attention. The two main proteins in dairy are casein and whey. They are digested and absorbed at different rates, while with whey appearing more quickly in the bloodstream than casein. Most protein supplements are based on whey, but that's more due to convenience because of its ready availability. It's a waste product from cheese manufacturing, after all. Whey protein is of particular interest because it appears to have a stronger anabolic effect on muscle growth, thanks to a higher content of a specific essential amino acid called leucine. Leucine is a branch chain amino acid and it is particularly popular for its ability to build muscles and activate a protein called mTOR, which triggers muscle protein synthesis. Now, the whey protein supplement market falls under three main types of whey protein. First, there is whey protein concentrate, which is typically 70 to 80% protein by weight with a small amount of lactose and fat. It's one of the cheapest forms of whey. Then next, we have whey protein isolate, or WPI. WPI powder is usually 90% protein by weight, with negligible amounts of carbohydrates and fat. Because of its higher protein content, it costs more than whey protein concentrate. And finally, there is whey protein hydrolysate which is characterized by shorter peptides or amino acid chains, supposedly resulting in even more rapid digestion, but evidence to date is conflicting. With a growing interest in vegetarian diets, soy protein is also a popular option. Soy is considered a high biological value, rapidly digested protein. It comes as both a soy concentrate and soy isolate. It is often used in mixed protein supplements and protein bars. While the balance of research indicates that whey protein may have a small edge for muscle building, some studies have found soy foods to be just as effective as whey protein in terms of its ability to promote gains in lean muscle mass. One study, for example, found daily supplementation of 50 grams of soy, whey, or a soy whey protein blend in 20 male athletes engaging in a weight training program all resulted in similar increases in lean body mass and did not negatively affect testosterone or estrogen levels. And I'll link to this study in the show notes. This shows that soy protein can be just as effective as whey protein in building lean muscle mass as part of a dedicated exercise and nutrition regimen. Pea protein powder is another protein powder that is growing in popularity, especially among vegetarians, vegans, and people with allergies or sensitivities to dairy or eggs. Pea protein is not absorbed as fast as whey protein, but it is absorbed quicker than casein protein. There hasn't been a lot of research into the muscle building properties of pea protein, but at least one 12-week study involving 161 men doing resistance training who took either 50 grams of pea protein, whey protein, or a placebo non-protein powder each day saw similar increases in muscle thickness between the pea and the whey protein groups, and both were superior to placebo. So there could be something to the pea protein story, and I'll link to this study in the show notes. And even studies that use lower quality protein, such as that derived from wheat, can elicit a significant muscle protein synthesis response if greater amounts of it are consumed. And this may be an effective strategy to compensate for its lower protein quality. 
So the story here is that adequate protein overall in the diet may trump the source of protein so long as the diet is varied. And on the topic of vegetarian diets, when it comes to strength and fitness, vegetarian athletes can perform just as well as their omnivore opponents. To illustrate, in a recent study, the diets and physical attributes of 27 vegetarian and 43 omnivore competitive endurance athletes were looked at. Each person in the vegetarian group had followed the diet for at least two years, and there was a mixture of vegan and lacto-ovo vegetarians amongst this group. There was little difference in protein intake according to body weight between the vegetarians and the omnivores. Now, vegetarians did eat more carbohydrates and fiber, but they also had less vitamin B12, which is not so surprising seeing as animal foods are really the only major source of vitamin B12 in our diet. One interesting finding was that vegetarians had more iron in their diet than omnivores. But because plant-based iron is less bioavailability than animal-based iron, and check out last week's podcast, which was all about iron, then this may bring the vegetarians back on par with omnivores. So I'll link to this study in the show notes. The key finding from the study, though, was about sports performance. And for the males, there was little difference in cardiorespiratory fitness or strength between the vegetarians and the omnivores. The surprising finding, though, was in women. Women following a vegetarian diet had 13% higher VO2 max scores than women eating an omnivore diet. So it seemed they're actually a little bit fitter. So what about the downsides of protein supplements? Well, outside of cost, there can be some negatives. For a start, they can move the focus away from the undisputed benefits of a varied training diet. Purified protein preparations contain few of the other nutrients needed to support the building of muscle, and the protein they supply is usually not needed by athletes who eat food, as they're likely already meeting their protein requirements. The supplements then just become excess protein, which the body dismantles and uses for energy or stores it as fat. Excess protein does not harm the kidneys in healthy people, but it has been linked to worsening pre-existing damage, so it is something to be aware of if this potentially could be you. So here's what you need to know about protein. To maximize muscle growth with resistance exercise, daily protein recommendations sit at the upper end of about 1.6 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight. This target can be achieved by spacing protein-containing meals approximately three to five hours apart throughout the day. There can be some cases, though, when protein supplements make it more convenient to hit this goal. But the biggest performance gains in sport don't come from protein supplements. They come from the triad of a broad, varied diet, adequate rest and recovery, and the one supplement that all athletes need to be taking. It's called BHW, Bloody Hard Work. Now onto my research wrap-up segment, where I profile a study that has grabbed my attention during the week. And for this week, the topic is on mental health. Interest in the link between nutrition and mental health is rapidly growing. Now a new study in young adults with depression finds that a switch to healthier eating can significantly reduce symptoms of depression. A healthy diet is a common factor linked to a positive mental outlook. The problem with most of the observational research in this field, though, is that it is hard to tease out which one comes first. Are people in the depths of depression more likely to eat poorly because of their mood? Or does a poor diet worsen depressive symptoms? There is now a small but growing field of research directly intervening with diet changes in people with depression to see how this can improve their outlook. One such study has looked at the link between diet and depression in young adults. Adolescents and young adulthood are periods where there is an increased risk of depression. These are also critical periods for establishing healthy eating habits, which will carry over into adulthood. So how nutrition influences the mental health of younger adults was the topic of a recent intervention study, 
and I'll link to this research study in the show notes. The study involved 101 adults aged between 17 and 35 years, all who had moderate to high symptoms of depression. They all were considered to have a poor diet when assessed against government healthy eating guidelines. Any person taking antidepressant medications or receiving psychological therapy were required to stay on that treatment plan during the study. The participants were randomly allocated into either a diet change group or a control group, which meant just following their regular diet. The diet change group were given advice on improving their diet. They were also given a healthy food hamper and a small amount of money for buying groceries to help with purchasing healthier foods. The diet changes focused on having more fruits, vegetables, whole grains, nuts, fish, legumes, eggs, tofu and lean meats according to the person's individual dietary preferences. The control group received no advice on diet and were left to continue their normal eating habits for the three weeks that the study ran. Symptoms of depression and anxiety with with overall mood and performance on learning and reasoning tasks were measured at the beginning and end of the three weeks. Those in the diet change group were indeed successful in making positive changes to their diet. With these diet changes, significant improvements in mood, depression and anxiety were all seen. No such changes were seen in the control group. Three months after the study finished, follow-up was made with 33 of the participants to see how they were tracking. One in five of those in the diet change group were still keeping up with the healthy eating habits, and for these people, their mood improvements stuck. The clear downside to this study, though, was that the control group did not get any general eating advice, financial support to buy food, or checking contact with the research team. Each of these factors potentially could have had an impact on mental health independent of diet changes. The results, though, are in line with a previous intervention study that did mostly control for these types of factors and equally saw a marked improvement in depression symptoms with positive dietary changes. This study adds more support for the benefits of positive dietary changes in improving mental health. Counseling, emotional support and medications all have their role to play and now it seems that diet is another cornerstone to consider in dealing with depression. So that's it for today's show. You can find the show notes either in the app you're listening to this podcast on if it supports it or else head over to my webpage at thinkingnutrition.com.au and click on the podcast section to find this episode to read the show notes. If you find this podcast of value, then please consider sharing it with your friends and colleagues, or maybe even leave a review. This all helps increase the ranking and reach of the podcast, which means a big win for credible evidence-based nutrition messages while helping to dilute out the crazy and making the world a slightly less confusing place. I'm Tim Crow and you've been listening to Thinking Nutrition.